Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we'll be talking about the Central Intelligence Agency. Our conversation will focus on the history of the CIA's involvement in the difficult and problematic politics of the Middle East. My guest today is Dr. Hugh Wilford. Dr. Wilford is a professor of history and he has also written several books about the CIA. Welcome, Hugh, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Thanks, Dave. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, before we get started, I want to mention your most recent book about the CIA. It's called America's Great Game. I've had the opportunity to read the book from cover to cover, and I'm happy to report that uh, it's a fascinating read, and I think you've done a masterful job of interweaving the history of the region with the politics of the era, and you've included uh, a healthy dose of personal stories from the people that were involved at the time. So kudos to you on a, on a fine work. Thank you, Dave. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Well, let's get started with our conversation about the early involvement of uh, American intelligence operations in the Middle East. We know that during World War II, we had intelligence operations in North Africa and throughout the Middle East, of course in North Africa, because that's where the fighting was occurring uh, against the German army. Uh, those weren't called CIA operations at the time, but they were certainly the precursors to what would eventually become the CIA. Our officers and our agents and our operatives in the Middle East at that time during the war were in a great position when the war ended. America, in fact, had a golden opportunity to establish great relationships with the various countries of the Middle East, the Arab countries. Why was that the case? That's right. Uh, at the beginning of this period, the U.S. had barely any official presence in the Middle East uh, at all. But that's not to say that there weren't Americans there, because the, the, the were. There are some archaeologists, there are some oil men, but ab above all, there were missionaries and educators. Americans have been coming to the Middle East since the, the 19th century to, to convert the people there. But also, when that proved not to work, to, to educate them, to provide health care and other sort of forms of, of, of welfare. So there was this history of um, America. Americans in the region and, and of Arab-American uh, friendship. You know, uh, the U.S. was perceived uh, really very positively amongst the Western uh, countries in, in the region at the time. And it was from the ranks of these missionary educators or all their descendants that the U.S. Uh, drew its, it, its first officials in, in the region in the 1940s when it was starting to enter there for, for the first time. And, and uh, the, the power of the, the colonial Western nations such as Britain and France was, was starting to uh, fall away. Uh, so really this, this, was a, this was the beginning for, for the, the American official presence in, in, in the Middle East. And, and these officials could, could draw on this history of really quite happy uh, American-Arab relations. And we didn't have that uh, baggage of colonial history and imperialism that Britain had in France, and particularly with Britain. And I think that that gave us uh, a, a fresh start in the Middle East at the end of the war that Britain did not have because of that colonial history. And I think there was resentment toward, a lot of resentment toward Britain because of that. And we didn't have that resentment, as you said. We had the missionaries that were yes. the first representatives who went there with good intentions. Let's talk about the initial a uh, group of CIA officers that were stationed in the Middle East. It was an interesting group of individuals. There was a certain type of person that was drawn to the CIA in the Middle East in those early days. Give us a sense of the backgrounds of those individuals and why were they in particular attracted to the Middle East? Sure, that there are uh, a number of uh, young Americans, not necessarily drawn from the same sort of missionary backgrounds that I've just been describing, uh, but young Americans, who, young American men who go to uh, North Africa and uh, serve in the, the CIA precursor, the Office of Strategic Services, uh, its Middle Eastern headquarters in, in, in Cairo, and they really fall in love with the region. Uh, when they're when they're there, they're people. They're of, often they're drawn from quite aristocratic backgrounds. Uh, uh, the Office of Strategic Services (OSS) sometimes was known as the Oso Social because many of its members you know, had been educated at Ivy League universities, and before that they'd been to New England prep schools and so on. Pe people like Kermit Roosevelt, the grandson of the uh, the president Theodore uh, Roosevelt, and he was he was drawn to the. He fell in love with the region when he was there, but even before then he'd had. Uh, 
this taste for adventure. You know, he'd grown up reading um, uh, British uh, imperial spy thrillers by, by Rudyard Kipling. He was fascinated by the figure of Lawrence of Arabia. There was this romance about the, the region. It seemed to offer the prospect for, for personal adventure. So they, they went there with this kind of mixture of a desire for adventure on the one hand and, and this desire to do good works there as well that they'd absorb uh, from their, their missionary forebears. And so there was an, an exotic appeal to the Middle East, to these individuals that had grown up in these privileged East Coast backgrounds. Yes. There were actually two grandsons of Theodore Roosevelt. One is Kermit, or Kim Roosevelt, as you mentioned, and his cousin uh, Archie Roosevelt. And these individuals felt that they were there uh, because of a combination of sort of manifest destiny, meaning that they were meant to be there, and also a sense of noblesse oblige, which of course means uh, obligation of the noble class. And they thought that they had a responsibility to do good things for the people of the Middle East. Um, given that that was the case and that was their initial motivation, how did things turn sour with mm. our intelligence operations in the Middle East? That, that, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, that, I mean, they certainly started off with the best of intentions. They had this, uh, Kermit Roosevelt in particular, had this notion of building this kind of progressive, mutually beneficial uh, alliance between much more beneficial to the Middle East itself than had been the case in uh, British and French relations with, the, with the, the region. So he had this notion of Americans and young progressives, sort of modernizing Arabs working uh, hand in hand for uh, everyone's benefit. And he even, even wrote a book about this subject uh, before he joined the CIA. And he was a member of sort of lobby groups within the US that advanced uh, this point of view before he became an intelligence officer. But uh, as, as you suggest, you know, it goes wrong. I, I guess that the, there's, there's, a, there's a series of events in Syria in 1949 when a new leader by the name of Hosni Zaim is he's seen as a potential kind of American ally in the mold of these progressive modernizing Arab leaders that Kermit Roosevelt was looking around for but his his government only lasts a few months he's he's a, he's a colonel it's a, it, uh, he's involved in military coups uh, the, there's a change of government then another series of coups and Syria is kind of set on the course that, that it's still in today really you know it's it's that that, that history of instability starts in the uh, the 1940s but but above all I guess it, it's really that's what's happening on the ground in Syria back of this uh, are, are two big factors. What well, One of them is the U.S. and the Truman administration's sort of growing alliance with the new state of Israel, which of course doesn't play well with the, the Arab countries, and also the, the, the developing Cold War, which causes American leaders increasingly to look for stronger anti-communist leaders uh, in the region, you know, as opposed to to, to, to more nationalist uh, uh, progressives. Uh, so that, that's, that's the background really to, to what subsequently uh, goes wrong. It's interesting you mentioned uh, the situation in Syria and we, we certainly hear um, about Syria every day now in the news. But in those days in 1949, there was that initial coup that we supported, the CIA was in support of with Hosni Zaim. Yeah. But there were actually three coups in that year of 1949, yeah. which led to an era of instability. And as you mentioned, it seems to be there to this day. Yeah. Uh, so that was a wake up call, I guess, to our CIA operatives in the region that yes. this is not gonna be easy. Uh, and once you start the process of instability, that instability seems to just uh, domino throughout the region in, in, in many ways. Uh, I wanted to talk about those other two issues that you mentioned that seem to drive a wedge between America and uh, the Arab countries of the Middle East. First was the concern about the threat of communism and in particular the Soviet Union and the concern that uh, those countries were going to drift into the Soviet orbit. Yes. And, and then the other one of course was the partition of Palestine to carve out the state of Israel. Yes. And uh, those two issues never got satisfactorily resolved, at least at that time. And um, I think uh, in particular, when it came to the issue of Israel, um, the CIA officers on the ground were not in favor of creating a state of Israel, right. an independent state of Israel, because they perceived and they uh, believed that it would create a thorn in the side to relationships in the Middle East for years to come. And so in that way, they were prescient. They, they foresaw the future with that. 
But the official policy in the United States was support of Israel. And at that time, it was the Truman administration in 47 and 48. And so officially, America supported uh, the creation of the independent state of Israel. But our CIA, CIA officers on the ground, and some of them in Washington, D.C., had a different agenda. Tell us mm -hmm. about that different agenda. I know it involved the American Friends of the Middle East, which, is, which was a propaganda front. Tell us about yeah. that. Well, this is really one of the things that most surprised me when I was researching this book, was when I discovered to what extent these, uh, these young CIA officers were pro-Arab and anti-Zionist. Uh, indeed, Kermit Roosevelt, before he joined the CIA, actually sort of mobilized elements in American society that uh, didn't share the Zionist agenda and were, and were very pro-Arab. And he creates a number of groups. After he joins the CIA, a new one is created by the name of the American Friends of the Middle East. It's sort of made up of Protestant clergymen and oil men, and actually some anti-Zionist Jews as well. There was some opposition to the Zionist project within the American Jewish community. And uh, this this group receives secret money from the CIA, and it's, it's active in the Middle East but it's also active on American soil, you know, advancing the Arabist uh, uh, viewpoints and trying to combat the influence of the, uh, the, the Israel lobby, which is just starting to sort of emerge in the, the 1950s. So I, I, going on in the background, I, within the US itself, during all of this, is this kind of covert battle for the control of American public opinion as regards US Middle East uh, policy and especially relations with uh, with with Israel, with the CIA on the one hand and, and Zionist groups backed by the Israeli government uh, on on the other. It, 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 it's uh, for me, I think it's the most kind of surprising element of, of of the book, really. And I think in some ways it's kind of really quite interesting story. You know how. The, 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 these pro-Arab groups are really the ones who kind of control the levers of power in, 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 the, uh, in this early uh, Cold War uh, period, but then ultimately they lose the argument to, to pro-Israel groups. Right, and one of the uh, cases that, one of the cases that, that uh, comes out very strongly in this is the case of uh, Gamal Nasser in Egypt. Yes. And he was a leader that we felt we could work with. He was very charismatic, he was a capable leader, very smart. Uh, he wanted to uh, modernize his country and develop his economy. And uh, he had friends in high places at the CIA. And yet, uh, we were never able to, America was never able to leverage his skill and his uh, ability in the Middle East to uh, operate efficiently and develop a sort of a pan-Arabic alliance that would be friendly to the West. Why did that happen? Yes, the, the, the CIA uh, and uh, the, the, to some extent the Eisenhower administration that comes after uh, Truman, you know, really does see NASA as, as the future uh, in the Middle East. You know, he's, he's smart, he's charismatic, he's all the things that Paul Husney Zaim in, in Syria wasn't, he's popular. So the CIA backs him, there is a CIA team in Cairo providing uh, espionage training and, and sort of public relations work for a number of sort of advertising executives are brought over from Madison Avenue. I call this chapter Mad Men on the Nile because there's this kind of madman uh, angle to it. But, but yes, the relationship turns sour. Um, for a, for a number of reasons, but but chiefly, I think because um, John Foster Dulles, uh, Eisenhower's Secretary of State, uh, he's so fiercely anti-communist, he he grows to mistrust the nationalists around the world. You know, he thinks that if you're not entirely for the Western camp in the Cold War, you must be for the other side. And uh, as a result, um, and, and for other causes, the, the, the CIA can, can't work out an arms deal with the NASA. And the, the, what, what NASA wants above all is, is American arms. Uh, the US doesn't provide them, so NASA turns elsewhere. Hugh, we're gonna have to take a break right now. It's time for our break, but when we come back, we'll continue this conversation. And stay with us. We will talk more about the CIA's involvement in the difficult politics of the Middle East. We have a job to do out here today. To be a winning team, you have to work like a winning team. My team depends on me. And my team is 50,000 strong. Looks like a lot of work's going into this. This is what it feels like to be part of a team. A winning team. The action team. Action team. Action team. Get in on the action at actionteam.org. Are you in?
Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly. My guest today is Dr. Hugh Wilford. And Hugh, before the break, we were talking about Gamal Nasser in Egypt and uh, the fact that we had an opportunity to establish a really good relationship with Egypt uh, in the uh, 1950s. But because of uh, conflicts with uh, Egypt and Israel and because of our concern about Nasser being drawn into the Soviet orbit, uh, we had trouble. And you were talking about the arms deal that uh, Nasser wanted. And yes. he wanted America to help him with that. But because of our alliance with Israel at the time, that was very difficult for us to do. So he looked elsewhere. What happened? That's right. The CIA ca ends up not being able to deliver the arms. So the, the relation, what had been a personal friendship between Kermit Roosevelt and his, uh, his uh, main uh, agent in uh, Cairo at the time, Miles Copeland, uh, it, 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 it sort of sours and uh, NASA turns to the, 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 the Soviet bloc uh, for arms. This infuriates John Foster Dulles, who tries to slap him down. Uh, NASA's a proud man, you know, the, the leading nationalist in the Arab world, so he doesn't react well to that. And, and relations really are set for this downward spiral. It's briefly reversed by the Suez Crisis of 1956, in which the US you know, backs uh, Egypt against the, uh, against the British and French, but, but it, that doesn't arrest this kind of downward trend and by the late 50s uh, relations are bad and, and, and Kermit Roosevelt and, other, and Archie Roosevelt have effectively either left the region or left the CIA altogether and this kind of moment of, of, of Arabism within the early CIA has passed. And I think uh, another problem <clears throat> was that the concept of Arab nationalism which was something that the CIA officers supported initially. Yes. They wanted the countries to be nationalist meaning that they wanted to have sovereignty over their local governance and sovereignty over their economic development and so on. And that was very much supported by the CIA, but as that developed because of the Soviets sort of getting involved and because of other things that were happening at the time, uh, nationalism was misperceived yes. by the Eisenhower yeah. administration as a drifting towards socialist communist ideology as presented by the Soviet Union. That's ex exactly right. Yes, there's this uh, notion that, that if, if you're not uh, for us, uh, you're against us. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, you know, Dulles, like, like other Americans at the time, they, they had, you know, racial attitudes clouded this as well. You know, they, they thought that, that, that third world leaders weren't as developed as Western leaders and therefore that they were sort of prey to manipulation by the cynical uh, scheming uh, Soviets. So, you know, th there's this sort of notion in the Middle East and other regions as just being this this kind of chessboard. This is why it's America's great game in which, you know, the Soviets and the Americans are, are playing this game and the pieces themselves are just sort of in, inanimate. But as Dulles and others discover, in fact, they're, they're not. NASA's smart and has an agenda of his own. And we find out that uh, the CIA officers were then put in, a, in a, a, a bad position by the Eisenhower administration because they were told to carry out policies which these CIA yes. officers knew were not going to work. Yes. And then when those policies failed, then the Eisenhower administration said, well, you have no choice now. You've got to, you've got to develop a coup and overthrow those leaders. And so that, yes. was, that was a problem which plagued us uh, the rest of the time there. That's absolutely right, yes. Uh, although I mean, people like Kermit Roosevelt, they, they retained that sort of taste for adventure that they'd had since childhood. So they, although they didn't like Dulles' uh, policy, nonetheless, they did rather sometimes, you feel, jump at the opportunity to carry out regime change by covert means. And the classic example of that is, is Iran 1953, where at the same time that, that Kermit Roosevelt is backing the Arab nationalist uh, Nasser in Egypt, he's, he's working, conspiring to overthrow the Iranian nationalist Mohammed Mossadegh in, in, in Tehran. Just uh, for clarification mm. for the benefit of our audience, you mentioned the Dulles name. There are actually two yes. men by the name of Dulles. They're brothers. One is John Foster Dulles, who's the Secretary of State, and the other is Alan Dulles, who's the director of the CIA. And they are brothers, and obviously they work together. Yes. Uh, they didn't always see completely eye to eye on things, but they were the ones that were in control of our foreign policy at that time. 
That's right, John Foster, sort of covering the, the, the overt uses of American power and, 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 and Alan the covert. I mean, it's an extraordinary degree of power to be concentrated in the hands of uh, one family. And it reflects the extent to which you know, a lot of power still lay very much in the hands of a sort of the Anglo East Coast foreign policy establishment at this time. And it's the same, that's the same background that people like Kermit Roosevelt come from. Well, just to wrap up with uh, Nasser, uh, Nasser uh, just continued to drift away from us, uh, from America and from the West. He did several things which angered uh, Western powers. He uh, nationalized the Suez Canal. That got the British very upset and the French and they actually invaded. I think we may have mentioned that earlier. Yes. And uh, Eisenhower actually didn't go along with that and he said that was not a good thing to do. So yes. the British and the French and so on pulled out. But then later Nasser wanted to build the Aswan High Dam which was to protect the fertile farming land of, of uh, Egypt and also generate hydroelectric power for development. And uh, he couldn't go to the British because of uh, that bad history with the British mm. and most recently with the uh, canal issue. And he couldn't really go to America because of our uh, alignment with Israel politically. It was hard for Nasser to do that uh, in his own country. So he ended up going to the Soviets for financing and for engineering expertise. That's correct, yes. He, he didn't really have an awful lot of choice and he, uh, at the end of the, the, the day, uh, and uh, he, um, he was fed up with the American promises and, and which actually the Americans failed to, uh, to, to deliver. So uh, he was looking out for, for himself, for his country and for the Arab world. And this was something that, that a lot of Americans, John Foster Dulles especially, didn't really understand and, and didn't appreciate. And Nasser had a, a famous quote in your book when he was speaking to Kermit Roosevelt later. And he said, you know, the genius of you Americans was the fact that you never did clear, simple, and stupid moves. You always did complicated, yeah. stupid moves. Yes, yes. That's so that sort of uh, indicated how he felt about the Americans at that time. Yes, yes, yeah. It, it, it's this background of disagreement in Washington and the pressure on uh, the, the State Department of pro-Israel groups. It, you know, American policy is pulling in, in various directions. And NASA is uh, initially confused and then just ends up more or less walking away from, <laughs> from the deal. So. Uh, much to the, dis the disgust and regret of, of uh, Kermit Roosevelt and other Arabists in the CIA who had initially you know, backed him as the, the, the future of uh, the region and U.S.-Arab relations. As it became increasingly clear that coup attempts and covert operations were going to be the way that the CIA was going to manage situations in the Middle East, um, the National Security Council issued a directive about co covert actions, and this was in 1948, I believe. And um, basically covert operations were to give us cover for anything that happened that went wrong. And the concept then was plausible deniability. What was the concept of plausible deniability and why was it important in those days? Well, the idea was that the uh, CIA would carry out covert operations that the US government couldn't be seen to be sponsoring because um, the US, after all, is not at war with the Soviet Union officially, formally, although in fact there is a Cold War uh, going on. So uh, one needed to be able to deny official ownership of these operations, thus the, the notion of, of plausible deniability. Um, and, and it leads to you know, sort of a cult of covert action, by, especially by the time of the Eisenhower administration. You know, the CIA is very active all over the world in various regions where Washington thinks the, uh, the Soviets are, uh, are interfering. And, and just in fairness to the CIA, you know, they are given their, their head by Eisenhower and Dulles and, and they, they enjoy that and they, they exploit this freedom of, of action. Yet at the same time, they're not, a, they're not a rogue elephant as they were sometimes portrayed as being. They're often, you know, trying to carry out uh, the, the diktat of Washington. So, um, but th in any case, the ultimate effect uh, is, is a covert interventionism going on uh, around the world, which at the time, you know, seems like a cheap way of securing US strategic interests against the Soviet Union uh, and, and often was successful in the short term, but it turns out often had a regrettable long term consequences. And that brings up the subject of Iran. And we did support the, the uh, coup effort in 1953 in Iran that uh, overthrew the uh, 
popular uh, premier of Iran, uh, Mohammad Mossadegh, yeah. and the Shah was given ultimate power as a result of uh, that uh, coup effort sponsored by the CIA. And it worked out for a while with Iran. We had about 25 years there. But uh, something which is referred to as blowback occurred in 1979. Explain the concept of blowback uh, in regard to what happened in Iran. Yes, it's this notion that uh, actions which seem uh, like a good idea at the time consequently returned to, uh, to haunt uh, the, the, the country that instigated them, in this case the US, and have harmful consequences for US citizens. And, there are a number of examples of this, but a classic one is, is the CIA being involved in this coup in Iran in 1953, um, which overthrows, as you said, a popular prime minister. This is not forgotten in Iran. Uh, but Kermit Roosevelt remains, you know, personally uh, an unpopular, villainous figure in the Iranian imagination. And, and it, it, the roots of the 1979 uh, revolution can't entirely be traced back to this moment, but a, a good number of them can be. And the, there is this kind of surge of opposition to the Shah, who's been backed by the, the CIA and American uh, oil companies, uh, and a surge of anti-Americanism. And we're still living with the consequences of, of, of that phenomenon today in the Middle East. We just have a couple minutes left, Hugh, and I want to talk about another book that you've written called The Mighty Wurlitzer. But before we talk about that, just a quick uh, summary of what we've been talking about, and that is we see today that the Middle East is in turmoil. Uh, obviously, a civil war in Syria that's been going on now for three years. We've got ISIS developing the, um, the rogue terrorist group that uh, seems to be on the march in Iraq and Syria. We've got um, other difficulties that uh, you can point to throughout uh, the Middle East. The Arab Spring was supposed to bring about a democratic revival, but that hasn't worked out. Would things have turned out differently mm -hmm. if we hadn't been quite so manipulative with the CIA back in the 40s and 50s? No, no, that's a very good question. It's, it's difficult to answer categorically, but you know, clearly there, there are problems that had nothing to do with the US and the CIA, you know, the, the long-term effects of Western colonialism and, and, and uh, you know, underdevelopment and, and, and so on. Yet it does, there is a, an element of tragedy to this, that there was this moment you know, when the US was new to the region in the 1940s and I have an opportunity to really kind of restart the Western relationship with the region and, and, and ultimately that. The promise of, of American-Arab relations going back into the 19th century is, 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 is lost. You know, we just have about 30 seconds left right. now. But uh, you wrote another book called The Mighty Wurlitzer, How the CIA Played America. Give us a, a 30 second overview of what the book is about, propaganda front groups. Yes, it, it, it's CIA financing of groups of American citizens that appear to be independent, yet in fact they're receiving CIA money in some direction as well uh, via uh, fake foundations. Uh, the, there were an extraordinary number of these groups. They operated in America and, through, and throughout the world from the late 40s through the late 60s when it was all, all, all exposed. And it involves a number of surprising personalities. Uh, writer Richard Wright, uh, feminist Gloria Steinem was, was in a group that got CIA money. So. Uh, it's, uh, it's very much a Cold War story, but you know, there are still front operations going on today, so it still has some resonance even now, I think. Hugh, I wish we could continue this conversation much longer, but unfortunately uh, the, the clock is against us. So thank you so much for sharing your time and your information with us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Dave. And thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Join us again for another episode soon. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.